So on the Hybrid Ecosystem Experiment, I'm studying the response of uh, migratory birds to different timber harvest treatments. And that's important because research has shown that across the United States, migratory birds are declining. And uh, species that depend on shrubby young forest habitat are declining to an even greater degree. And so we're interested in how different tim timber harvesting treatments can create habitat for migratory birds. We've been monitoring populations of uh, migratory birds for the past 10 years. And that's involved more than 4,000 individual surveys and nearly 50,000 detections of individual birds of 65 different species. So one of the ways that we can assess the bird community at these sites is to look at the species richness, which is the number of species that are present. And what we found was that relative to the control sites, the even-aged and uneven-aged management units had about 20% greater species richness. So prior to the, tim the timber harvest being applied at the hardwood ecosystem experiment, we saw that bird communities were quite similar between the treatments. After we applied the harvest, we had some interesting findings, including the fact that 19 different species increased uh, following the timber harvests. And that included species of conservation concern in Indiana, like the cerulean warbler, the black and white warbler, and the hooded warbler. We also saw an increase in richness at those harvested sites of nearly 30%. Additionally, we did see declines in some mature forest species following harvest, including the worm-eating warbler and the ovenbird. So what we're finding is that in order to maintain a diversity of birds on the landscape, we need a corresponding diversity of habitat types. And right now in Indiana, we have a lot of mature forest, but what we don't have as much of is that early successional young uh, forest shrubby types of habitat that support a unique set of species. And one way to create that early successional habitat is through timber harvesting. Our research is designed to study the responses of bats to forest management. And we work on two state forests, the Yellowwood uh, State Forest and the Morgan Monroe State Forest in South Central Indiana. And we're studying two species of bats, the Northern Long-Eared Bat, which is newly listed as federally threatened, and the Indiana Bat, which is a federally endangered species. We have a general understanding of how bats respond to forest management in that we know that without forests the bats will not have successful they will not have sufficient roosting habitat. Uh, also bats depend on forests for foraging habitat. So we know that we need intact forests, but we don't know what age the forest needs to be, what the basal area, how many trees per acre there needs to be, what size the trees need to be. We don't have a great understanding of that uh, for the bats that are really imperiled. There's been more work in fragmented woodlots that are riparian woodlots along uh, streams here in Indiana than there has been in these more intact contiguous forests uh, like the state forests in south central Indiana. And so we are studying the responses of these two species that dwell in forests in the summer to the different treatments that are being implemented on the hardwood ecosystem experiment. So how do these bats respond to patch cuts, shelter wood cuts, clear cuts, single tree selection, the different practices that are being used on the state forests. And we're studying their responses in a number of ways. So one is just looking at the distribution of the bats across the state forest. So we're doing capture surveys in a number of areas across the forest to figure out what the bat community looks like and what the relative abundance is for these two target species. We're also putting radio tags on the two bats, the Indiana bat and the northern long-eared bat, tracking them to their roost trees, and then doing foraging telemetry, which involves going out at night and uh, measuring where the bats are on the landscape, so actually following the bats as they fly around the landscape to understand how they're using the landscape. And so with these different pieces of information, we'll be able to piece together a better understanding of the foraging ecology of both the Indiana bat and the northern long-eared bat on these state forests, in these managed forests. Yeah, so our, our work in the managed forest, um, looking at how the bats respond to the timber, harvesting so far, we're seeing that it doesn't seem to have a negative effect. It's either neutral or, or even positive. Um, they definitely seem to take advantage of these small patch cuts that are replicated across the landscape. Um, so when you have many of these small openings, 
that are implemented in different years, you, the bats have several options um, that they can fly to these different patches and look for different types of food. So in addition to the bruce trees that uh, these bats require and small forest openings, Indiana bats and northern long-eared bats need a, a permanent or stable source of water during the summer. And then they also use corridors through the forest. So uh, for, for both of these species, we capture them routinely over these small half acre forest ponds on the Hardwood Ecosystem Project. And these bats are likely coming to these ponds to get a drink of water to fuel uh, their lactation process and also to recover after um, hours of spent on the wing foraging. We also see bats flying down stream corridors and along ridgetop corridors, which may be roads. And it's likely that they're using these as commuting corridors to get from one place to another in the forest very quickly. So these linear openings are really important as well as the non-linear openings uh, represented by those small patch cuts. The Surin warbler is one of the most rapidly declining migratory songbird in North America. We know that Syrian warblers breed in mature forests and oftentimes these forests are associated with these canopy gaps. So my graduate students and I were interested in finding out why this species is declining, uh, what its habitat needs are, and uh, if it is reproducing successfully in Indiana state forests. Banding uh, has been very challenging. Uh, this is the fifth year that we've started to band. We started about four years ago and this is our fifth field season. But this year has been especially challenging because we have set up mist nets in our usual locations which are close to the ground and we have not had any success until recently. We decided to try a different capture technique and that was to set up a canopy mist net and so far we've been very successful in capturing birds. Well, one of the really interesting findings that we found is that this particular species does respond to timber harvest. In other words, it responds positively. So what we've noted is that we have found several nests that have actually been constructed very, relatively close to these openings that have been created in um, the um, forest canopy. Another really important um, factor that we've uh, found out is that oaks, especially white oaks and hickories are very important tree species for this particular migratory songbird. We found that males will use oaks and hickories as song perch trees and these are usually the some of the taller trees in the canopy and females predominantly use oaks and hickories to construct their nests. They will also remove nesting material from grapevines that often will grow along these trees. And we found that both males and females will forage for caterpillars to feed their young. And the species that produce a lot of caterpillars are oaks and hickories. A third component that we've found is that some of our birds actually do come back that have been banded. And this is an indication that these birds have been successful in previous years and we've documented that they've been successful. And these are primarily males. But we were really excited last year when we had a female that was banded three years ago and she actually came back to almost the same location for three consecutive years and each year she was successful in raising young. Active forest management that promotes the regeneration of oaks, specifically white oaks, but also other species of oaks and hickories, and in the process creates small openings that certain wolves are attracted to, will benefit the species in the long run. So the key to Surin warbler conservation is to create a suite of characteristics that the species uses for its nesting and also for its singing on its breeding grounds. The woodland salamanders that I study are very small and they're lungless. 
uh, which means they require moist environments so that they can breathe through their skin. It's not commonly known, but salamanders oftentimes outnumber all other vertebrates in a forest ecosystem. This means that they're incredibly important for food webs in terms of providing food for other predators, uh, but also in controlling microinvertebrate prey in the forest floor. So anything that we do in, in terms of forest management that might affect the relative abundance could have a, a trophic cascade or a cascading effect on wildlife in the forested ecosystem. So in order to understand the response of woodland salamanders to timber harvest, we utilize what are called artificial cover objects, which are simply a wooden 2 by 12 cut into one foot sections and placed throughout the forest environment in grids. So in total, we had over 3,000 artificial cover objects throughout the landscape. We had these in areas that were in uncut areas or our controls, as well as our areas that were slated for both types of harvest treatments. And we collected two seasons of data pre-harvest, as well as five seasons of data post-harvest, again, to study the immediate effects on the effect of timber harvest on the relative abundance of woodland salamanders. We checked our cover boards every two weeks for two months in the spring and two months in the fall for each of those seven seasons. So over the seven sampling seasons, we captured nearly 20,000 salamanders. And from this data, really two general trends emerged. First is the harvest treatments that left the canopy intact had no declines in salamander abundance. Whereas those that did remove the canopy did have moderate uh, declines in salamander numbers, at least at the local scale. Uh, we also measured the edge effect of these clear cuts into the adjacent forest land. And what we found is that those clear cuts only affected salamander abundance about 20 meters into the adjacent forest. So at the landscape scale, these small canopy openings really didn't have any effect on salamander abundance. So what this means in terms of managing forests for woodland salamanders is, you know, all the effects that we saw were at the very local scale. We found no indication of impacts at their broader, more landscape level. Uh, so if you think about the harvest openings used on a hardwood ecosystem experiment, those small openings are probably compatible with maintaining local salamander populations in a contiguous forested landscape.